What is the purpose of life? I have reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. However, beyond my career, I find little joy. Wealth is just a fact of life that I've come to accept. Whether a house is 300 or 30 square meters, ultimately, the loneliness remains. At some point, you realize that true happiness doesn't stem from material things. Whether you choose first class or economy, when the plane lands, you still have to disembark. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple and a symbol of business success, wrote this in his last letter. Life has no purpose. Don't be surprised. The whole idea of purpose is flawed. It arises from greed. Life is pure joy, a play, laughter, without any purpose at all. Life is its own purpose. It has no other purpose. The moment you understand this, you understand all there is to know about meditation. The most important thing to remember is that life is not a business. It doesn't exist for a specific purpose. It exists for the pure joy of being. There are no goals. Thus, the moment you achieve silence, meditation, awareness, prayer, and you are able to live fully in that moment, there are no goals, no end. Living passionately in that moment is a blessing in itself. Life isn't logical. Life isn't philosophical. It is more like love than logic. Have you ever asked why you love? For what purpose? Have you ever wondered why you enjoy watching a beautiful sunset? Why a starry night is beautiful? Why a rose is beautiful? It is about living your life in complete joy, with no purpose at the end, no purpose in sight, no purpose at all. Like little children playing on the beach, collecting shells and colored stones. For what purpose? There is no purpose at all. Chapter 1. Perspectives from Osho Meditation is about living your life with complete joy, fully and without any purpose at the end, no anticipated purpose, no purpose whatsoever. It's like children playing on the beach, picking up shells and colored stones for what purpose? None at all. Underscore underscore Osho. When I was a child, I used to bring home many stones and shells from the river I collected, and I would go to bed with all sorts of stones and shells in my pockets. And my father would say, throw those away, what are you carrying them for? And I would always ask him, first answer me, what are you living for? You keep doing business, making money, raising your children, for what purpose, for what? And my father would say, it's totally pointless to argue with you. Just go to sleep. Keep your stones and whatever else you want to keep. But he would forget, and when he saw all those stones in my pockets again, he would ask, for what purpose? And I was always ready. First prove to me what you are living for. If you can keep money in a safe, why can't I keep my stones in my pocket? I don't have a safe if you give me one. I'll keep my stones in the safe. Prove it to me. That's your question, not mine. I never ask anyone. For what purpose? Eventually, he dropped the idea, thinking, this kid is absolutely incurable. When I came home from university, he didn't ask me about marriage, a very natural thing in India. The moment you return from university, the first thing is, now get married. He knew me that it would create unnecessary argument. So indirectly, he asked one of his lawyer friends, who was very good at arguing and often shouted in court and was famous for winning impossible cases. And he often won those cases just because he was the loudest person in town. He would bang the table and shout and throw law books and create such chaos that everyone was afraid of him. And they were friends, so my father asked him. The lawyer said, this is simple. I've beaten big lawyers, I've convinced very sharp judges, and I've won cases even for murderers, so this is nothing. I'll come tomorrow. He came and he asked me, why aren't you getting married? 
I said, absolutely, I'll get married. He was completely baffled, didn't know what to do, because he came fully prepared, with all arguments in favor of marriage and its beauty and its joy and its intimacy and all kinds of nonsensical stuff. I said, absolutely, where is the girl? Do you have a daughter? He said, weird. Your father told me that you are hard to convince, but you're not arguing at all. I said, I'm not arguing. I'm ready to get married. Just bring the girl. But first, before you bring the girl, you have to tell me one thing. You have to convince me of one thing. What have you achieved through your marriage? I trust you. You are a friend of my father. You are almost like a father to me. I trust you. If you say so, I will get married. But you have to tell me one thing. What have you achieved? Because I know about your married life. You might have won many cases in court, but I know what happens in your house. You have not been able to win even one argument, and I will go straight to your wife. He said, what are you implying? Why would you go to my wife? What does she have to do with it? I said, before your wife, you have to prove what you have achieved, what your life has been for, what joy you have reached. And I said, I will get married, I'm ready, if you can convince me about what your life has achieved, all those arguments you prepared, and I didn't give you a chance. But if you cannot convince me, then you will have to divorce your wife. Either I get married or you get divorced. After that, I went to his house every day, and sometimes he hid in the bathroom, sometimes he hid beside the back door. His wife became very worried. What's the matter? Why is he afraid of this kid? And she asked me, what's going on? He isn't even afraid of me like that. He hides in the bathroom. He says he's sick. Tell that kid that. And he's not sick. He keeps thinking about you. What's going on? I told her, that's the issue. That's another question for your husband to think about. He has to prove it. And I've spoken to every neighbor. I will gather every neighbor who are witnesses for me that his life is the most miserable in the whole town. He has to prove that he has reached some bliss. If he can't prove it, then he has to divorce you. She said, what? I said, that's the issue. If I have to get married, then he also has to put something at risk. It's a gamble. I'm gambling my whole life. I'm gambling my future. He has to gamble his past. I have no past, he has no future. He listened from the bathroom. He ran out and touched my feet. He said, forgive me, and I'll never bother you again. Don't disturb my life. I've been in so much trouble and you haunt me every day. Even in my dreams at night, I see you, and I know you can defeat me. You've got my weak spot. Life has no purpose. Nothing has any purpose. That is the beauty of life. The moment you bring purpose into it, you destroy the beauty. Love has no purpose, and meditation is absolutely beyond the idea of purpose. There is no end point outside of it. It has intrinsic value. It is not a means to an end. It is an end in itself. Chapter 2. Answers from J. Krishnamurti Why do we question the meaning and purpose of life? What are we seeking through the concept of life? Is life itself not the purpose, the inherent meaning? Why do we crave something more? Often, our lives become empty and monotonous, filled with repetitive and superficial activities. This emptiness, coupled with a dull routine, drives us to seek a deeper meaning in life. Those who feel their lives are rich and satisfying, who accept things as they are and are content with their reality, rarely question the purpose of life. For them, life itself is both the journey and the destination. However, our problem lies in the emptiness we feel. We try to assign a purpose to life, but these efforts are merely products of thought, devoid of any truth. When that purpose is driven by ignorant minds or empty souls, it too becomes meaningless. Therefore, our goal should be to enrich our lives, not materially but inwardly, steering clear of mysticism. 
When someone says that the purpose of life is happiness or the pursuit of God, it often reflects a desire to escape from life. These goals, predefined by our limited understanding, can never truly represent God. True understanding only emerges when we engage with life, not when we flee from it. When we seek a purpose for life, we are actually trying to avoid understanding what life truly is. Life is about relationships and the actions within those relationships. When we fail to understand or manage these relationships effectively, we search for a fuller meaning. Why is our life so empty? Why do we feel so alone and desperate? Often this happens because we do not reflect on and understand ourselves. We avoid recognizing that this is the only life we know and that it needs to be fully and completely understood. We prefer to run away from ourselves, and that is why we search for a purpose of life separate from our relationships. If we start to understand our actions, meaning our relationships with people, possessions, beliefs, and ideas, we will discover that these relationships themselves provide their own rewards. There is no need to look elsewhere. Like the search for love, can you find love by searching for it? Love cannot be nurtured by pursuit. It is found within relationships, not outside them. Because we lack love, we search for a purpose in life. When there is love, it is eternal by itself, and then there is no need to search for God, because love itself is God. Our minds, cluttered with technical information and superstitions, make our lives feel empty, and that is why we seek a purpose beyond ourselves. To find the purpose of life, we must go through the door of ourselves. Consciously or not, we avoid facing reality as it is, and so we plead for God to provide us an escape. The question of life's purpose is only raised by those who do not love. Love can only be found in action, in the relationships we maintain. Chapter 3 does success truly bring happiness? Winston Churchill, the former Prime Minister of the UK, in his final moments remarked, I am bored with it all. Leonardo da Vinci, heralded as the greatest genius of all time with roles including painter, musician, and inventor, confessed, I have disappointed God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Isaac Newton, the eminent scientist, reflected on himself by saying, I do not know how the world sees me, but to myself, I seem to have been only a boy playing on the seashore, finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered before me. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple and a symbol of business success, wrote this in his last letter. I have reached the pinnacle of success in the business world. However, beyond my career, I find little joy. Wealth is just a fact of life that I've come to accept. Whether a house is 300 or 30 square meters, ultimately, the loneliness remains. At some point, you realize that true happiness doesn't stem from material things. Whether you choose first class or economy, when the plane lands, you still have to disembark. These poignant words clearly show that despite reaching the pinnacles of fame and fortune, these individuals did not feel content or fulfilled. They each harbored their own private sufferings and continually yearned for more. This demonstrates that achievement, fame, and wealth do not equate to the cessation of suffering or the attainment of complete happiness. Chapter 4 – Understanding the Purpose of Life According to the Buddha and the Saints In this life, nearly everyone to some extent wonders, what is the purpose of life? What is the true meaning of this life? Is it that humans are born, grow, learn, work, build families, have children, grow old, and then die? Throughout the decades of existence, having experienced success, happiness, and myriad hardships, 
sorrows, and failures. Years marked by more sorrow than joy, more worry than relief, and more bitterness than sweetness. So what really is the purpose of this existence? In this world, all humans, except the saints, whether young or old, male or female, rich or poor, intelligent or not, of any race or religion, all ardently seek happiness, joy and pleasure, whether material or spiritual. This behavior dominates every moment of human life. If we observe carefully the behavior of desiring, longing, seeking joy and happiness naturally arises from the belief. The purpose of life is to enjoy happiness. But is the purpose of life really to enjoy joy and happiness? If this perception is true, then in Buddhism, it is called understanding or wisdom. If it is not true, it is known as ignorance or delusion. The purpose of life is to end suffering. Each person is different, and so is each moment in life. Thus, our quest also continually changes. This search may include things like money, possessions, knowledge, fame, power, success, essentially, both material and spiritual means to attain pleasure, joy, and happiness. However, upon closer examination, we find that what humans truly desire is not these things. Humans do not really need them. What they are striving for lies beyond them. What is it? As they strive for material and spiritual happiness, they think, if I have these things, then I will cease to suffer. Therefore, every action of individuals, groups, classes, religions, nations, or humanity as a whole aims towards one single purpose, to end suffering. For example, when humans venture into space to explore galaxies, the real purpose is not knowledge of the cosmos, but to use that knowledge to help humanity on Earth end suffering. When decoding the genetic map, the goal is not understanding genes, but to invent new methods to free humans from illness and end suffering. There may be arguments that the purpose of life is to end suffering and also to enjoy joy and happiness. However, the joy and happiness that humans desperately desire are truly what they are striving to attain in the future. Because they are currently overwhelmed by suffering, they perceive that if they have these things in the future, they will cease to suffer. But deep down, what humans really need is to end suffering, not happiness or pleasure. In reality, humans use joy and pleasure as a means to an end to suffering. For example, for a drug addict, even though drugs bring a temporary, wonderful feeling of happiness, do they truly need that happiness? They only use drugs when the addiction kicks in and their bodies are tormented by suffering. Once the suffering is alleviated, they no longer feel the need to use. Similarly, people need sleep when their bodies are tired. They do not need happiness from sleep, but only need it to quell the feeling of suffering. Even sexual happiness is not a constant need. It is sought only when desire rises so strongly that it becomes unbearable. However, the truth is, happiness does not end suffering. Observing our own lives and those around us, as well as information from the press and media, we see that nearly everyone has their own suffering. Those who are not yet wealthy or successful labor day and night, the wealthy toil to protect and grow their assets, the single suffer from loneliness, those who are married tire from family responsibilities, those who are infertile painfully seek ways to have children, and those with children worry about raising them. Healthy individuals seek material and spiritual happiness such as money, status, and fame. Thus, regardless of external circumstances, all of humanity experiences suffering throughout their lives. The perception that the purpose of life is to seek and enjoy joy and happiness is a mistaken understanding. Each time a goal is achieved, a new goal arises, and the vicious cycle of suffering continues, 
shifting from one form of suffering to another. Chapter 5 The Dual Burden Suffering and Happiness in Buddhist Philosophy In the exhausting journey of life, most of us feel as though we are carrying a heavy weight on our shoulders, comprised of suffering and worries, and we all wish to wash away this pain and replace it with joy and happiness. However, few realize that on each person's shoulders, this burden has two ends. One end is suffering, and the other end is joy. In reality, the desire to leave behind one end of the burden is merely an illusion. In Buddhist scriptures, there is a vivid example of this. A person lives with four venomous snakes, any one of which could kill instantly with a bite. This person must feed, shelter, and bathe these snakes, even though they are always ready to kill him. He lives in constant tension, trying to escape their pursuit. While hiding from the four snakes, he accidentally encounters six robbers with gleaming swords chasing him. And while fleeing from both the four snakes and the six robbers, he comes face to face with a giant bandit chief with a long spear who yells, I will kill you. He runs into empty houses looking for a place to hide, eventually reaching a riverbank and seeing across the river a land free from snakes robbers or bandit chiefs, a place of absolute peace. He quickly makes a raft from branches to cross the river to that peaceful place. This side, from which he is fleeing, symbolizes the worldly realm filled with suffering, while the other side, the place of peace, symbolizes nirvana, the eternal liberation from all suffering. These images not only illustrate the four basic elements that make up the human body, earth, water, wind, fire, but also suggest that we live to satisfy the demands of the body. These demands do not stop at the physical level, but also affect our eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. To meet these demands, humans must labor intensively and struggle incessantly, leading to endless bitterness and sorrow. That is why happiness is always intertwined with suffering in an unbreakable chain. Humans continuously pursue spiritual pleasures like philosophy, science, literature, and music, creating wonders, sublime and sacred. Yet, desires and cravings still chase us, tormenting our souls. The image of the empty house with nowhere to hide clearly shows that whether in the sky, under the sea, or in the middle of a desolate desert, there is no place where one can escape from suffering. The Buddha taught that desires bring little joy, but much suffering, worry, and even greater danger. With a clear understanding of this dual burden, perhaps humans can truly find a way to lay down one end, as there can be no happiness without accompanying suffering. The journey across the river, from the worldly shore to the shore of Nirvana, is the quest for liberation, to escape the endless cycle of suffering and happiness, aiming for eternal serenity. Chapter 6 Conclusion The perception that the purpose of life is to enjoy joy and happiness is a misunderstanding, a delusion or illusion. It is from this illusion that people crave and seek happiness with the aim of ending suffering. Therefore, no matter the success or the amount of material or spiritual happiness one achieves, humans cannot reach the goal of ending suffering. Each time a desire or dream is fulfilled, one might think they have reached their goal, but a new desire emerges, and the goal recedes just as before. Recognizing joy, happiness, and pleasure as merely means to achieve the true purpose of life, which is to end suffering, reveals that these means cannot actually lead humans to this end but only keep them circulating within suffering merely exchanging one form of suffering for another, sometimes even more severe. 
No one on this earth, regardless of how much joy or happiness they have attained materially or spiritually, can escape suffering. A poignant example is Elvis Presley, the King of Rock, who was successful in terms of fame and wealth. Before he left this world, he sang his last song, which moved his fans to tears with the refrain, Why does disappointment come whenever I endlessly seek? This was his own admission, endlessly seeking happiness but always encountering suffering, which persists. This is a terrifying truth. After hearing this, many people acknowledge this horrifying reality, but instead of asking, is there a means a path that can truly end suffering, they simply exclaimed, oh, if everyone is like that, then so am I. The Buddha, after ending suffering, taught his experiences. Those who believed, understood, and practiced his teachings achieved the cessation of suffering and are known as arhats. These saints, upon reaching the goal of life, which is to end suffering, proclaimed, birth is extinguished, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming back to this life. Only the enlightened truly see this. The purpose of life is to end suffering, and this is the real destination of humankind. Those who have reached this destination realize this themselves. When suffering ends, there is no longer any craving, attachment, or bond to any joy happiness, or material or spiritual pleasure. For these individuals, it doesn't matter how they eat, where they sleep, what they wear, whether there is medicine available when they are sick or not. It all becomes irrelevant, leaving only the minimal needs to live out the rest of their lifespan. 